The 80s was a time for expansion for comic books. No more were comic books mostly being read by children, but now by adults. The thirst for more adult content and not the mainstream was at its peak. This brought on the age of the independent comic books. Where the kids that grew up reading DC and Marvel superheroes wanted to make their own comics. These new creators wanted to make comics that spoke to them with more violence, edginess, darkness, tackling real life issues such as politics, depression, and even death. We saw legendary writers rise up during this time such as like Alan Moore, Frank Miller, and Neil Gaiman. These writers and many others changed the landscape with what is possible with comic books to speak to a new generation of readers, ones that wanted more from their comic book stories. We also saw Marvel and DC expanding their universe with storylines that brought every character together for one massive story. Not only did the 80s have some of the best music ever, but we saw something new creep into the world of comics, and that would be merchandising. With George Lucas's Star Wars in 1977, he passed up an additional half a million dollars directing fee so he could keep all the merchandising and licensing rights. At the time, that was thought of a very foolish thing, but it later turned into billions of dollars. The toy company saw the writing on the walls and they wanted a piece of that. So that led them to licensing out Marvel and DC to write comics with storylines that they could basically use as marketing to kids to get them to buy their toys. They would even make cartoons specifically to entice kids to buy their toys because during this time it was all about getting that massive toy money and they would use any means necessary. So with independent comics jumping in the fray, overarching storylines and toy driven comic books flooding the market, which ones came out ahead and which ones got shoved in the back of the DeLorean and were left back in time. Well, in this video, we are gonna look at the top 10 1980s comic books for investing. The Crow, number one. The second appearance of The Crow, an independent comic produced by a brand new company called Caliber Press. The Crow first appeared on the back cover of Dead World 10 in 1988 and then had his first full appearance in a short story inside the pages of Caliber Presents No. 1 at the beginning of 1989. The comic was created by James O'Barr as means of dealing with the death of his fiance at the hands of a drunk driver. This was the perfect segue comic to enter into the 90s with its blend of darkness, griminess, and overall sadness vibe that would grip the first half of the 1990s. The Crow went on to feature Bruce Lee's son, Brandon Lee, as the lead actor in the film called The Crow, who actually ended up getting shot and killed in real life while on set filming this movie. In 2012, a 9.8 throughout the whole year averaged $650. In 2017, it averaged $13.93. And in 2022, it averaged 14,400. In five years, that is up 934% and 10 year return of 2,115%. During that same 10 years, the Dow Jones was up 141%, S&P 500 up 183%, Amazon was up 849%, Apple was up 534%, and real estate was up 80%. As you can see in the 10 year return, the Crow beat most of these other blue chip stocks that I have up there. And we all know Amazon Amazon and Apple were massive over the last 10 years. Now I know stocks, comics, and real estate are very different kinds of investments. They all have their pros and their cons, but this gives you a general idea that you can compare to blue chip stocks like Apple and Amazon, to real estate and comic books, to just give you a general idea. Now many of you are probably thinking, well, why not go for Crow's first appearance? Well, there's actually less on the census for Crow 1 first printing than there is Caliber Presents. It's a much harder book to get in high grade due to its hard black cover. It shows a lot of defects. Also, The Crow only had a print run of about 10,000 and went on to sell 750,000 copies in various printings. So that led it to be way more desirable than Caliber Presents number one. They made multiple movies, TV shows, and even video games, and there's talks of a reboot happening. Saga of the Swamp Thing 37, the first appearance of John Constantine. Swamp Thing was a formulaic and poor selling monster magazine. Then editor Len Wayne decided to take a chance and bring an outsider from across the pond to work on Swamp Thing. He brought on Alan Moore, 
who deconstructed and reimagines the character, addressing environmental and social issues along with the horror and fantasy. Also, he used many of DC's supernatural characters like the Spectre, Demon, and Deadman, and the new John Constantine. The comic was a massive success, and John Constantine was given his own comic line called Hellblazer, which was on DC's more mature imprint, Vertigo Comics. It went on to be the most successful comic on that imprint, reaching up to issue 300 before being brought over to the DC main comic line. Constantine was played by Keanu Reeves in the 2005 film of the same name, also appeared in many animated movies along with his own short-lived TV show. In 2012, a 9.8 averaged 169. In 2017, it averaged 403. And in 2022, it averaged 1791. That has a five-year return of 344%, a 10-year return of 960%, with a record price selling for 3,700 in 2021. The future looks bright for John Constantine with all the movies, animated, and also TV shows. It was also the longest running comic on that imprint. Amazing Spider-Man 252, the first appearance of the black suit, which later became the symbiote that would become Venom. But David, what about Marvel Team Up 141 and Spectacular Spider-Man 90? If you look at those comics, you'll see the same publication date, May of 1984. But the release date and the publication date are not the same. Usually comics are released a few months prior to their publication date. So the actual release for Spider-Man 252 was at the end of January 1984, and the other two comics came out two weeks later. So this makes Spider-Man 252 win between all three of them. But the actual first published appearance of the Black Suit was in Comics Journal 85 in October of 1983. The Black Suit wasn't even Marvel's idea either. It was a comic book reader named Randy Schuler who pitched the idea to Marvel editor Jim Shooter, and he actually bought the idea from the kid for only $220. At first, the comic readers hated the new suit and demanded they change it back. So in issue 259, they changed him back to the classic suit. But then of course, the readers missed the black suit. So then they had the black cat make him a new black suit that wasn't the symbiote, but just a cloth one. In 2012, a 9.8 averaged 268. In 2017, it was 438, and then 2022, a 9.8 average, 18.57. That is a five-year return of 324%, a 10-year return of 593%, with a record price of 24.51. The black suit, which is the symbiote, went on to be one of the greatest anti-heroes of all time in comics history, and that would be Venom, which spawned many different movies, cartoons, and of course, video games and all that stuff. Batman The Dark Knight Returns number one. The Comic Code Authority came out in the 1950s to make comics more kid friendly. Ever since then, Batman had drifted away from his darker roots. He became more campy and associated with the 1960s Batman TV show. Neil Adams in the 1970s started to bring back Batman to his darker roots. But it wasn't until Frank Miller's 1986 take on the Batman where we finally got to see Batman go to his darker, more mature version that we're used to today. In 2012, a 9.8 average 276. In 2017, 724. And in 2022, a 9.8 average 1353. That is a five year return of 87% and a 10 year return of 390% with a record price of $2,980. You might be wondering, this comic is a lower percentage increase than previous books. But this list isn't about what gained the most percentage. This list is more what's gonna be the best long-term investment. And with this book, there's been so many films, animations based off it. It's widely considered one of the greatest and most influential Batman stories ever published, as well as one of the greatest works in comic art in general. It went on to have 1 million comics printed and the original art to the first cover just sold for $2.4 million, which is one of the highest amounts ever paid for a comic book cover. Amazing Spider-Man 238, the first appearance of the Hobgoblin. For decades, there was only one goblin, the Green Goblin. The writers of Spider-Man were constantly under pressure to have Spider-Man fight the Green Goblin, but they grew tired of bringing people back from the dead or having the mantle switch to another person. So they decided to create an heir to the Green Goblin, the Hobgoblin. Roderick Kingsley was the real Hobgoblin, but he'd always get some other criminals to play the role. Then the writers would kill off that person and out would pop another Hobgoblin, which constantly confused the reader. 
The Hobgoblin was a massive hit through the 80s. With no one knowing who the real Hobgoblin was, this created one of the longest running mysteries in Spider-Man comics. In 2012, a 9.8 on average was 441. 2017, 650. And 2022 is 2,882. A five year return of 343%, a 10 year return of 554%, and a record price of $4,100. Transformers number one. The first appearance of the Transformers in comic books. Originally, they were a Japanese toy from the toy line Diaclone and Microchange. Hasbro bought the rights to the molds and rebranded them and sold them as the Transformers in North America. In order to market these new toys, they had Marvel Comics write up a limited four-issue comic run to explain their backstory, since they did so well with the G.I. Joe's American Hero line. They also commissioned to have a cartoon series to help promote as well. The toys were released in May of 1984, while the comic books and cartoon show came out in September of 1984. The Transformers were a massive hit, which extended the initial show run up until 1987, and the comic, which was only supposed to be a four-issue limited series, ended at issue 80 in 1991. In 2012, a 9.8 averaged 164. In 2017, 354. And in 2022, 2050. A five-year return of 479, a 10-year return of 1,150% a record price of $3,202. The Transformers had a million different spin-offs in the comics, in the animated space, and they had a massive movie franchise that is still going on to this day. And unlike the G.I. Joe American Hero line, that kind of fell by the wayside over time, but the Transformers continue to still be massively popular. Daredevil 168, the first appearance of Elektra. It was created by Frank Miller, and originally he intended this to be Elektra's only appearance, but she continued to gain in popularity and was a major villain for Daredevil all the way up until her death in issue 181. Frank Miller did not want her to come back, and after being gone for nearly a decade, Marvel brought her back in issue 324 against his wishes. Elektra continued to grow in appearing in many different films and even TV shows. In 2012, a 9.8 was $662. In 2017, it was $1,009. And in 2022, a 9.8 was $8,375. That was a five-year return of 730%, a 10-year return of 1,165%, with a record price of $13,200. DC Comics presents 26, the first appearance of the new Teen Titans. The New Teen Titans series was one of the most popular series during the 1980s, with George Perez and Marv Wolfman on the title. The series introduced Deathstroke, who would be the inspiration for Deadpool and Marvel. There were many superheroes on the Teen Titans, but the lineup that was introduced in DC Comics Presents 26, Robin, Cyborg, Raven, Beast Boy, and Starfire, that is the most popular lineup. With that team appearing in many different TV shows, animated movies, and cartoon shows still going on that has 356 episodes so far spanning over nearly a decade. In 2012, a 9.8 averaged 181. In 2017, it averaged 605. And in 2022, it averaged 1795. That is a five-year return of 197%, a 10-year return of 891%, with a record price of $2,850. This lineup of the Teen Titans is extremely popular. At any given point in time or the last two decades, there has been some form of media for these Teen Titans, whether it be a cartoon or a TV show or a movie or something like that. And currently, they have a show aimed at kids, Teen Titans Go, and they have one for adults, the Titans. Amazing Spider-Man 300, the first appearance of Venom. The appearance of Venom was a long drawn out one. He first appeared as a symbiote in Spider-Man 252. Then the mention of Venom's existence was in Web of Spider-Man 18 when Spider-Man was pushed in front of a train without a spider sense going off. Then again in Web of Spider-Man number 24, an arm grab Spider-Man. Then appearing in the shadows of Amazing Spider-Man 298. And then finally as a cameo on the last page of Spider-Man 299. Then we got his first full appearance in Spider-Man 300. Venom was a perfect example of what the new decade was about to be over the top, more mature, anti-heroes, and more extreme. Venom became an overnight success, which had fans clamoring for more. And throughout the 90s, they gave us Carnage and a bunch of other symbiotes. In 2012, a 9.8 
sold for $600. In 2017, averaged $1737, and in 2022, a 9.8 averaged $5,311. That is up 206% in five years and a 10 year return of 785% with a record price of 8,500. Venom went on to become one of Spider-Man's greatest villains of all time. And of course it helped a lot that Todd McFarlane became a massive rock star in the comic book space and that boosted Venom to even higher heights. And of course Venom went on to have multiple movies of his own. He appeared in multiple cartoons, all that kind of stuff and was even featured in many different video games. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one. This is the first appearance of the Turtles. They originally started out as a joke to make each other laugh. Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird were heavily inspired by Frank Miller's Daredevil run and made the Turtles into a parody of Miller's Daredevil run. Hence why the ninja group known as the Hand got changed to the Foot, Daredevil Sensei was Stick, and the Turtle Sensei was Splinter. The first issue sold out instantly with only 3,000 copies printed. They went on to make four more printings with each having higher and higher print runs and they still sold out. The Turtles were popular in the comic world but didn't see mainstream success until 1987 when their toy line came out. In order to promote the toy line, they made a five episode cartoon series, which let's be honest, had probably the best theme song out of any cartoon ever. The toys and cartoon exploded beyond anyone's wildest dreams. The original cartoon lasted 10 seasons, over a decade, and the toy line went on to be the third best selling toy line of all time, selling $1.1 billion worth. In 2012, a number one first print 9.8 sold for $17,925. In 2017, it was $26,828. And in 2022, a 98 average $207,611. That is a five-year return of 674%, a 10-year return of 1,058%, with a record price of $245,000. I can't stress how popular the turtles are. At any given point in time since they came out, there's been pretty much a cartoon, a movie, a TV show, something in some form of media happening at any point. I mean, the first movie became the highest grossing independent film of all time, bringing in $200 million off a $13 million budget. Even their first video game sold 4 million copies, making it the best-selling Nintendo game that wasn't made by Nintendo themselves. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are the most popular comic book slash superhero characters to come out of the 1980s. Starting out as a small, independent, self-published comic book by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, the Turtles grew to become the most successful independent comic book characters of all time. I'm David from Comic Book Investments. Have a great day.